Voice of the Sea, learning from experts across the ocean. Welcome to Voice of the Sea. In this episode, we traveled to Guam. We met up with Terry Donaldson. Well, Terry, thank you so much for having me here. Um, I'm really excited to learn about your research and you're studying spawning aggregations of a couple different varieties of fish. Actually, we're studying uh, spawning aggregation behavior of reef fishes, trigger fishes, groupers, parrot fishes, and our early example today with, with, was, was with surgeon fishes. So uh, a lot of the same mechanisms are involved. Um, we're trying to do comparisons between fishes that spawn every day, like humphead wrasses, the Maori wrasses, uh, and fishes uh, such as uh, surgeon fishes that cue in on lunar cues, so some phase of the moon, they really get excited about it. Uh, and then fishes that maybe spawn once a year, all right, um, some groupers, snappers, that sort of thing. And we're looking for underlying mechanisms um, to drive these different behaviors. We're looking to explain variation in these behaviors. So some places they do it in the morning, sometimes they do it at night, and you want to answer or ask a question, so go ahead. Can you tell me what a spawning aggregation actually is? Yeah, it's, um, it's a temporary formation of a group of uh, fishes, the same species, obviously, that move to a specific site at a specific place and time for the purposes of spawning. All right. They gather together, uh, again, daily, weekly, monthly, once a year. Um, they um, go through courtship and spawning. Sometimes they'll spawn in groups, uh -huh. sometimes paired individuals, sometimes six uh, go up at once, whatever, it depends on the species. The whole idea is, is that they only mate in a certain location and then they go back to wherever they're from until the next time. And why is it important to understand this spawning behavior? Uh, a couple of different things are, are primary importance, uh, aside from certain uh, evolutionary considerations. Um, you're familiar with the term shooting fish in a barrel. Well, if you get all your fish in one spot at one time to reproduce, uh, fishers naturally can target them and the overfishing can take place. Right? So one of the things we're interested in doing is seeing where the spawning aggregation sites are so we can afford them some type of protection, either in time, you know, just limit access for a certain period of time, sure. or spatially set up an MPA that protects the site all the time so that the, the fish are protected while they are spawning. And then they go back out of that location and then fishers can have a go at them, you know, as they normally would, I guess. Right. So that MPA would be a marine protected area that would right, uh, yeah. stop fishing during a specific time or in a specific location. Sure. And uh, again, that's going to depend on the species. So the other thing that's of interest is that more than one species can use the same site. And so we're also mm -hmm. looking at the characteristics of the sites to see what makes it nice, a nice place to have sex, so to speak. <laughs> and right. what have you found out? Um, certain types of habitat are obviously conducive. We tend to find um, passes or cuts in the reef, like uh, where we were this morning. Um, fish can cue in on water movement patterns and uh, float on, go to those spots. It's sort of like a cue that they can um, use uh, to find a, a location that when they spawn, it allows their, their larvae or the eggs and larvae to disperse. The other thing might be, um, let's say, a, a, a promontory or something, like a point that sticks out either underwater or above land but into the water and then underwater. Something like that that they can reference and go to. Again, currents are going to come into play because they want the larvae to disperse somewhat. Um, and the fishes tend to, to find these things. And tides come into play, it's time of day, sunset, middle of the day, uh, sunri or sun, sunrise, sorry. And uh, sometimes the same species does it more than one way. <laughs> That's why I have a job. Yeah. <laughs> So this um, need for current to disperse the, the larvae once the eggs and sperm have come together, uh, and that would be the reason for the passes or the, uh, the jetties, if you will, sticking sure. out into the water. Does the tide also provide current, or does it just oh, provide yeah. a cue? No, tide, tide is current in many respects. It just moves water about, and, and fish generally pick a time when it's most favorable in their minds, I guess. Uh, there's been, you know, lots of history going on here with that, but um, as far as the fishes are concerned. 
In other words, it's some conditions that allow the larvae to get out of, away from predators as quickly as possible. I see. Now maybe they want them to go far away, or maybe when the tide turns, the same larvae are going to come back over the reef. The jury's still out about what's more important, but ideally the fish want their larvae to disperse somewhat to avoid predation and other factors that can come into play. So you can't be out in the water every day just watching for fish. I mean, well, that would be pretty fun. But how do you find out where they're spawning and when? All right, a uh, couple of <laughs> different ways. I used to be out in the water almost every day and pull out, <laughs> but I'm not afforded that luxury here. Um, we take it local knowledge from fishers. We also look at habitat that we think is promising based on what we know from research conducted elsewhere, research I've done, research my colleagues have done. Um, or we just do exploratory surveys, so things like manta toes, where they tow snorkelers behind a boat until we come to some likely real estate, and then we see fish doing their thing. Um, again, we like to time those surveys to when we think fish will be doing something. Um, because we have a, a lot of fishing on Guam, a lot of these sites where fishes, such as groupers, may be aggregating might be out of reach, so we're starting to use um, underwater video that we can deploy deeper. We're using side scan, um, uh, down scan sonars to help locate these schools of fish or uh -huh. their sites. And we can map them, reference them to GPS locations, and get a pretty good feel for where they're likely to be, and then go back and look for them. So a lot of advanced technology coming into play. It's not big time advanced technology, <laughs> but yeah, actually it's, it's, it's still very useful. Um, I have colleagues, people who do work with Sea Grant in the Caribbean who've really written the book on a lot of this and um, we're trying to apply our, their techniques plus th some of our own, like this GPS stuff that we use, to um, um, get a better understanding of what's happening here. So explain to me the, the GPS work. Okay, well we have GPS um, receivers that are actually reasonably accurate um, and we put them in a waterproof proof housing and we run on what's known as a track function. And this allows us to take readings while we're swimming in the water um, or being towed behind a boat <laughs> in the water, et cetera. And what it does is when we have our, our watches, electronic watches, set to GPS time, we can, over a certain period of time, you know, um, intervals of a minute or five minutes or whatever, depending upon how we're swimming, uh, record what we've seen in a given area. And when we get these big clusters of fishes together, uh -huh. we have a time set for that and a GPS location so we can go back in the data later nice. and figure out where they are. Then we can start mapping the distribution of the spawning aggregation sites. Manitos have been really useful for that when, with respect to parrot fishes, for instance, because they spawn every day in the morning and it depends how little or, or how much tide is running uh, as opposed to, as to explain what time of the day they're doing it in the morning. I see. Um, but for other fishes, it's just, you know, they cluster up, we see them here, a lot of them, and then they, you know, we have a, a good geo-reference point for them. This is work that Pat Collin at the Coral Reef Research Foundation uh, did with me some years back. Um, this is a, a place called Oolong Channel in Palau, uh, in the Rock Island area, it's on the west coast. And it's a channel that goes up uh, into the reef area, and it's got pretty good tidal flow, and it happens to be the spawning aggregation site for at least three to four species of groupers, plus uh, big trigger fishes that we see. And using the GPS technique, we swim transects variously uh -huh. through the site, and we're able to record locations of where we see fish. And when you get big circles, that means that there are a lot of fish there. Uh, and uh, we have a GPS location for them. So over time, we do this every day, uh, morning, afternoon, and s just before sunset, and then we sit and watch their behavior afterwards because I think they'll spawn then. Um, we can build a picture from day to day to day of, of how the aggregation moves into a site, where they aggregate finally to court and spawn, and then how soon they vacate the site until the uh -huh. next time around. Uh, and this works for all different species. And this particular site uses, is used, as I said, by three species of groupers. Some will be down here, some will be here, and some will be here. So they're partitioning the site. So when I look at something like that, it, it looks like a difficult management decision. There's a lot of places in that channel where uh -huh. fish are spawning. Yeah, but <laughs> it's not that big a channel, and it's, and it's part of an MPA, thankfully. But yeah, there's other, there are other locations that I can't disclose that are in Palau, where if you have a snapper, for instance, uh, Dr. Collin has found that um, 
there will be over 100,000 snappers at this one spot at one time of day spawning and then they vacate and they don't probably don't come back till next year at the same time same wow. place and so you can imagine a how exciting that be is but b how, uh, how kind of a problem that might be if somebody knew where that location was and went in and overfished it so it makes them very vulnerable absolutely yeah plus those sites need to be protected because you know you've got operations going on tourism or shipping or fishing or, or whatever and they all cause problems uh, for the aggregation Another thing that we talked about today is the aggregations are good not just for, for people fishermen, but for other types of wildlife that fish, like the manta rays. That's example. right, yeah. I wish I had photographs to show you, but um, one of my students, uh, Julie Hardup, has found that manta rays, she and some friends of hers have found that manta rays will come into the spawning aggregation site of, of surgeon fishes. And after the surgeon fishes have spawned, the water is full of eggs. All right. And manta rays are planktivores. They eat eggs, amongst other things. And it's sort of like a happy time. Uh, <laughs> they get to feed really well. Man has been at this a long time. We're talking you know, several generations um, from an evolutionary perspective. They know when to come. They can make predictions about what's going to happen, uh, when, and, and, and where. And so they target this. Uh, a colleague of mine in the Caribbean working in Belize has found the same thing famously for whale sharks. Whale sharks have learned to find where all those snappers come in. And uh, they show up like someone's been ringing a dinner bill and then they, they, they take their bit. Uh, here with the manas, it's a bit of a new thing. So we're, this is some exciting research that we, we hope to be able to shed some more light into what drives all of this and, and, and who participates. and, and uh, those types of things. So do you think that by uh, learning more about the mantis behavior, they might actually help you to understand what the fish are doing? I think it's coincident. Um, <laughs> I think the mantis are taking advantage of, it's not a free lunch. They had to learn about where to find it, but they're just taking advantage of the situation. Uh -huh. The surgeon fishes are just going to spawn. And because there's so many of them there at one time, there's a sort of a swamping effect. And while many of their eggs will be eaten, mm -hmm. a lot of them will not be eaten and then they'll go out and do their thing and they'll be lost for whatever reason and maybe less than 10 percent of what spawned at that given site will ever survive to become an adult but that's still pretty good if you think about it so um, again the manas are just opportunistically feeding and there are other predators that do that too they can be little damsel fishes or cesio uh, or some other types of planktivores that will come in for that Sometimes sharks come in and have a go at the fish when they're spawning, according to, um, but usually not. So. so what are some of the most interesting things that you've seen in your pursuit of, of understanding these spawning aggregations? Uh, today we saw uh, several hundred surgeon fishes in one spot of a single species. You don't normally find those densities along a given stretch of reef. And these fishes are territorial, famously so. So they don't want anybody else in their turf. They're always fighting. But when you see hundreds of them together, it's actually awe-inspiring. Right? And it gives you really feel, a really good feeling for just the abundance of fishes that are at any given location at a, at a given time. And the flip side of that is when those numbers start decreasing, you know you've got a problem to address. So if you see fewer, lower abundances when you monitor this over time. So the spawning aggregations might also be a way to monitor the population of uh, the fish. Yeah, species. absolutely. And it's in general, it, it helps you to, uh, to monitor uh, reef, reef health in general. Uh -huh. right? If you've got a real viable system, uh, the aggregations will be you know, functional um, because there is such a thing as dysfunction. If you have too few fish to aggregate, <laughs> there's no party. Right? Um, it also gives you a good idea about relative abundance of fishes in that particular area. And in general, it's an indicator of, of, of fish stock health. So I, I, I noticed today that for me, like when we were following the fish and they were aggregating, you could tell that they were all really excited. And then after that period passed, I did notice them starting to fight with other fish and yeah, their behavior changed dramatically. Uh, just like anything that mates probably. Um, once they get it over with, it's uh, back to the usual grind. So they started to disperse when we were following them. They were actually moving away from the site. Uh, and then eventually some of them will just stop and say, oh yeah, this is my territory. Set up shop, start eating and start fighting with intruders, that type of thing. You know, and then the next time, which will probably be a month from now, they'll be back and they'll all be interested in one another in a different way. And, uh, 
we'll see meeting again hopefully. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. My pleasure.